Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, sound okay? Great. Okay, uh, today we're going to be talking about a new computational pattern, uh, convolution. And uh, we're also going to be looking at another type of memory, constant memory, as a way to speed up convolution, in part. Okay, so those are the two big topics for today. Uh, I would suspect that most of you, actually I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, some of you for sure are already familiar with the idea of convolution. And some of you for sure have never heard of it before. Uh, so today we're going to kind of level the playing field here and uh, talk about something in my mind that is as important as matrix multiply in the modern computing context. So even though this course is not about linear algebra or things like convolution, it's the side benefit of the course to kind of introduce you to these things that you're going to cross paths with them. Okay, so let's just dive in. A um, few administrative things. Uh, <coughs> Lab three due on Friday. Uh, lab four is coming. Lab three, as you know, if you've started it, is about tiled matrix multiplication. And lab four will involve convolution. We're going to go through uh, in class a one one dimensional example today, and a two dimensional example today and on Thursday. <clears throat> the convolution that you're going to implement for lab next week <clears throat> will be a three-dimensional convolution. Okay, so the ideas that you're going to learn about today, you will use and build on them for next time. Make sense? Okay, so that's that. Uh, now, off in the distance, it's still a month away, roughly. What is the date today? Yeah, about a month away. Um, is exam one. Uh, it is on Tuesday, October 11th. It'll be in the evening, and as a reminder, it's going to be purely online. So you'll be able to do it uh, wherever you're comfortable, by yourself, and pretty much everybody in the course will take the exam at the same time. Okay? So again, it's nothing to worry about at the moment. But just, you know, make sure you're aware of it. It's on your calendar uh, because it'll sneak up on us faster than we realize. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions before we start? Okay, good, good. All right, so... Now, when I was introduced to convolution, I have to admit, I was probably your age. Uh, probably, I was a sophomore uh, at university. And this had no relevance to me. I took a signals course, like many of you who are double E's, probably took 210 here if you're an undergraduate. Uh, and you learn something like this, and you're thinking, well, you know, I want to work on computers, and this has nothing to do with computing. And in fact, it's simple, but it's so boring and dry. Why do I care about this thing? This is kind of the way we describe a convolution on a mathematical basis. Okay. And yeah, that, you know, the, the continuous integral version of it, where we're taking two functions, f and g, and doing this crazy convolve operator on them. I, I mean, I, I think I just went in one ear and out the other because I saw no relevance to it. Probably people sitting around me were feeling the same way. Obviously, some of them went on to study these things for things like uh, digital signal processing. But it, I didn't understand it. I didn't really get why this was so important. It turns out to be one of the most important things today. And I will motivate that and explain to you why as we go through today's lecture. 
Right, so the continuous version, yeah, snooze fest. I was not interested. Kind of mildly more interested in the discrete version where f and g are functions on discretely defined domain x. And you kind of look at it as a sum of these two discrete f and g multiplied together. That particular equation right here with this form, you've seen it. Right? We've seen it for linear algebra, for, a, uh, for the vector dot product. So now things start to have a more uniform language. Okay, now let's put this aside because we're actually going to talk about not convolution, although we use the word convolution. It's actually cross-correlation, which is a close cousin, in fact, so close, a cousin of convolution, the mathematical form, that people use the term interchangeably. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about from a signals perspective is actually cross-correlation. But let's see what that means. Okay, now, it turns out, well, I didn't understand it you know, back, whatever. I'm not even going to tell you how many years ago, but when I took it, I didn't fully understand it, but we now know much more strongly that we can use this operator, this convolution operator, on signals. So things like audio signals, video signals, pixels, all kinds of signals, and it's an incredibly powerful operator. So powerful that we're going to just do it over and over and over again to get any real kind of understanding or meaning or processing done on these types of digital signals. Now, literally, when you take a phone, a picture with your smartphone, dozens of convolutions are performed in order to take that image, that raw pixel image into something that looks aesthetically pleasing. When you blur your background, yeah, more convolutions. All those are convolutions. So it's a fundamental part of uh, you know, computational photography and of video processing and of image processing and of audio processing. Let's find out, what is all this stuff? I'm going to move through the words, and we're just going to go to an example. Okay. So let's say we've got a one-dimensional signal. And in the, the, the best one-dimensional signal I know of is an audio signal. Right? So you record it with a microphone, and it's just a series of samples in time. Let's say one of these arrays is an audio signal. It's a series of audio samples in time that represent what? What does that audio signal represent? Yeah? Amplitude. Amplitude, like uh, the, uh, the audio signal. <clears throat> How loud is it? So it's just the amplitude of the audio signal at various points in time for as long as we're recording that signal. Okay, so that's what it is, and we can play it back, we can record it, we can play it back, we can email it to each other. But how do we process it? How do we make it sound better? How do we do anything with it computationally? And that is where the convolution comes into play. Okay, let me describe it to you on a raw terms. Like, what, what physically are we doing? Or Digitally, are we doing? Computationally, are we doing? So we're going to start with this idea of a mask. Okay. And this mask, actually, the mask is right here. Let's say this is our audio sample. And right now, we only have seven here samples. But obviously, it can go on much, much longer. And then 
Corresponding to it, we've got a mask. And in this mask, we've got M0, M1, M2, M3, M4. It's a mask of five elements. Okay. And what we're going to do is take this mask, which has some number of weights in it. So three, four, five, four, three. And we're going to take that mask and we're going to calculate a new version of the input. Let's call it P. So N <coughs> is the signal, M is the mask, and P is the output. P is the processed signal. Okay? And the way we're going to process the signal is essentially use this as a set of weights to calculate the new output. So let's take this mask and let's just overlay it on the first five elements. Okay. So really what I'm saying is take the one, multiply it by the three, take the two, multiply it by four, three by five, four by four, three, five by three, and then add them together sum them. These are the weights, these are the inputs, multiply and add. Okay, and so if I do that, I add a 3 plus an 8 plus a four, 15 plus a 16 plus a 15, and that is my new value of the center element of that convolution. So the center element is this one. P sub 2. Okay? Now, it seems like an arbitrary computation. Why did I do that? Why did it, what's the meaning of all this? Okay. And it turns out, while it's not intuitive at first glance, I'll give you an example in a few minutes that will just make it click. So hang on. That's the operator from a computational basis. So if we were going to calculate P sub 3, right, what do we do? How do we calculate P sub 3? So in your own mind, you don't need to raise your hand. Just kind of walk through the same steps I did to calculate P sub 2. Right, and actually you can come up with a number. That would be the new, that would be P sub 3. Right, so... You follow the same pattern. Okay, I'm going to take the mask right here, and I'm going to center it over N3. Why do I center it over N3? Because I'm calculating P3. So I center it over N3, so that means this 5, the center element, will be multiplied by 4, and so on and so forth. And I don't know what the answer is, but you hopefully can calculate the, or at least write down the expression. Okay. That is, at its very simplest form, the idea of a one-dimensional convolution on a one-dimensional signal. Any questions about that? <clears throat> Good. Okay. Now let's handle a few of the edge cases and let's just make sure that we all understand. By the way, this mask, um, for all purposes for this course, will always have an odd number of elements, right? Because we're talking about centering it over um, uh, the element that we're trying to calculate kind of, we're going to keep things symmetric. It's a symmetric mask from that perspective in terms of size. <clears throat> okay? All right, so let's handle a few of the boundaries. So what do we do? I guess P sub 3 was right here. I'd forgotten. Um, so if we're trying to calculate P sub 3, we kind of walk through and do what I had said, and we end up with uh, 
3 times 2 plus a 4 times 3 plus a 5 times 4 plus a 4 times 5 and a 3 times 6. We sum them together, so p sub 3 would be 76. So now we need to talk about what we do on the edge cases because it's not clear how we would calculate p sub 0 or p sub 1. And if we had, sorry about the strange formatting here, uh, the conversion to PDF I think messed up. <clears throat> if we had an end to the signal, meaning let's say n sub 100 was the last element of the input signal, then we have boundary condition at the end. Certainly we have a boundary condition at the beginning, but we could also have one at the end. So what do we do about calculating p sub 0? Well, if we center the mask here over p sub 0, this means the 5 maps to the 1, the 4 maps to the 2, the 3 maps to the 3. But what about these other things here? What do we do about them? So we have to handle the boundary. And there's never a single answer there. It depends on what it is we're trying to accomplish. Okay, sometimes we replicate the boundary values, meaning we're just going to take the 1 and extend it out because it's the first element. Sometimes we put zeros. Just say, okay, if it's off the edge, those are all zeros. And again, it depends on what the thing is the convolution is trying to accomplish. So we just have to make sure we, we handle them, and then that's it. That is a one-dimensional convolution. And by the way, we sometimes call these elements that hang off the end ghost elements, because they're not really there. But we need to put something there in order to make the computation flow forward. It has to be defined, right? So that's it. Questions. It's a one-dimensional convolution. Yes? In a signal processing context, we usually see the mask flipped before we do the, con like the operation. Why is, that, why is that a thing, like, I'm in logic? Thing? Because then it corresponds to the mathematical form of the convolution. Um, it, it, when we kind of move into images, the flipping is a bit arbitrary. Yeah. So once we have the mask, whether we flip it or not, it's a mask. Okay, it's a good question. All right, good. So let's write some code, right? So now clearly... If my audio signal were millions of samples long and I wanted to do a, a convolution on it, I've got a lot of computation going on. So how do we parallelize that using GPU? So the simplest form is to say that, okay, we've got a bunch of threads that are calculating P. P has a bunch of elements. If the input has a million elements, the output has a million elements. So I'm going to take a million threads, and each thread is going to calculate, let's say, one output. Kind of makes sense. We can have one thread calculate multiple outputs, coarsen the threads if we wanted to. But just to keep things simple for now, let's say one thread, one output element. We end up with a convolution kernel that looks like this, right? where we have each thread has to recreate what is my original index in the original iteration space. So that's what we always do, which is to say, calculate i. Block index times block dimension plus thread index. It's all single dimensional because the input is a one-dimensional input signal. So super easy. 
By the way, if we look at the input parameters, I've got N, I've got M, which is the mask, I've got P, which is the output, I've also got the mask width and the width of the entire data, the input data. So those are the sensible parameters that we would need here. And then I calculate I. I figure out what the start point is for my convolution loop. Right? Really, my start point is to say, well, I've got a mask of size 5 or of size 7 or of size 9. They're all odd, right? Because, again, I said that we're going to have a symmetric in size mask. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, if my mask is of size 5, I divide it by 2. That's an integer division here. So I'm just going to drop the fractional part. So uh, if my mask is of size 5, it divided by 2. Mask width over 2 is really, in this case, 2, 2.5, but I dropped the fractional. So that's 2. I take my index and subtract that off. So I'm just backing up two positions. If it was a mask width of 7, three positions, and so on and so forth. That's my start point. So what I will do is I'm going to iterate from 0 to the mask width because I want to do the convolution. I'm just going to sum those individual components together where I'm just going to use the start point plus j as my way of iterating through the input. Okay, so here is the actual convolutional loop right down here, and I'm doing it for the mask width. Okay, and then I've got to add this conditional in there. Why? Clearly, pretty obvious. I have to make sure that I'm not reading elements that are off the boundary. Okay. Why don't I need an else here? Like, okay, if they're off the boundary, I should be doing something, but I'm not. If it's in the boundary, then I'm doing something, but not otherwise. Yeah. Does kernel just zero elements? Exactly. If, I'm, if there are zeros, then there's no need for me to do anything to update p-value. I could multiply by zero if I wanted to, but why bother? Question. Again, for a lot of computation where we're going to assume zeros for the boundary, off the boundary, then I don't really need to multiply by zero. I don't need to add a piece that's a multiplication by zero, right? Because I'm not changing p-value. I could, but it's not going to change anything. Yes? Sorry, a little louder, please. Is there some form of normalization that happens as well or not? Not in this case, but I, we're going to see that in a moment. So his, he asked... Is there a form of normalization that we need to do here? And I think what he's asking, maybe I read into your question, is, well, p-value, okay, so I calculate this output matrix, or output signal p, where I'm just taking all the, the neighborhood elements and then multiplying them together by some weights and adding them together. So my output P, if my input N were here, my output P is going to be much higher because I'm always adding stuff to it. So typically what we'll do is we'll kind of normalize the output signal P by, some, by dividing everything in order to kind of make things equal level. I'll give you an example. Okay. But yes. That's, we will do that. By the way, if we wanted to do that, how do we do that? If 
we wanted to normalize the output. Very simple. Somebody, yeah? Wouldn't we just have a normalized uh, filter for um, whatever you call it? Yes, but just very simple, right? Here's the code. How do I change the code to normalize the output? Yeah? Not divide over mask width. Divide this by something, right? So here's p-value. I said p-value is high because I'm just taking the input, multiplied every element by the weights in the mask, and then sum them together. So the output values are going to be much higher than the input values, assuming all my masks, mask coefficients are positive. So how might I want to normalize? Yeah. Let me just kind of cut it short a bit. What I could do is take the sum of all the mask widths and just divide p-value by that. I know what those are. and They're constant. So it's a constant factor I'm multiplying everything by. Let me just divide by that. So that's what we often will do if we're trying to normalize the value of p, right? No computation involved except for one division to do that. Question. Why would you also divide by mask width? Like mask width? You said I think you divide by like the sum of the mask coefficients. Why don't you actually divide by the number of mass values that you're Well, I don't need to because Let's say all my mask values were zero except one. And that was 50. So I'm, let's not worry about this, okay? Because it really, this is very specific to the con convolution that you're trying to do. Let's just say that we can normalize just by dividing p-value at the very last step. By what? It just depends on the, the thing you're trying to accomplish. It's hard to talk about convolution in generic terms because um, there's so many different ways to do it. I want to move on to a 2D convolution. Okay, the 1D case, hopefully, uh, pretty simple. And let me, let me insist that the generalization to the 2D case is also very simple. Except now, clearly the N, which is the input, is a 2D input. The output, therefore, will be a 2D output. And likewise, the, in, the mask will now extend into two dimensions as well. So here's a mask that's a five by five mask. And again, what we're gonna do is take this mask, center it over the input that we're trying to calculate, which in this case would be N, or I'm sorry, P, 2, 2. Okay, so we're trying to calculate P, 2, 2. And we center the 5 over N, 2, 2. We take the corresponding values of N, multiply them by the corresponding values of M, and we arrive at this intermediate output matrix, which we then have to sum in order to generate the output value P. So in this case, 321, right? And again, what we'll do, like if you're trying to visualize the process, this mask is, we're kind of sliding it over the input in order to generate P. Now remember that, because next time when we meet Thursday, we're going to take the sharing that results from that sliding and try to optimize the memory communication of this kernel. We're not going to do that today. Today we're just going to say, okay, we're trying to calculate P22. Here's the raw computation that you need to do. 
clearly, if we're trying to calculate P to 3, I don't really need to recalculate everything because I calculated some of it already. We'll take advantage of that next time. So P23, I'm just going to slide everything over, recompute. Slide everything over, recompute. Slide everything over, recompute. Okay? So there we go. Clearly, what we see is the fa effect that we talked about last time. P22 is 321. N22 is 5, right? We're getting this shift in level that we might want to normalize. Make sense so far? Now, let's start to think about this, right? What is a 2D, what's our favorite 2D signal? An image. This is an image. What is this thing doing? We can start to ask that. Some interesting things are going to come out of that. But let's talk about the boundaries first. So here we go. We've got um, this convolution here that we're doing. And what we want to calculate is P21, right? That's on the boundary. No, that's P20. P10, sorry. P10, uh, row one, column zero. And it's on the boundary, meaning if I took the mask and I centered it over P10, I've got a bunch of elements that are in the mask but hanging off the edge of the array. You can see visually what that looks like there. So again, we're just going to assume that those ghost elements are going to fill in with zeros. So they're not involved in the computation. But the rest have values, and we want to multiply them together with the mask in order to generate the output. OK. So we're thinking about this from a computational perspective. That mask is sliding around on the image as we generate the output, even on the boundaries. Okay, any questions about this? Yes? So, is Yeah, in fact, that's a good point. Um, he, he brings up a very good point that, okay, if we're normalizing here versus normalizing in the middle, clearly I've got all these mask elements that should not be involved. Okay, so should I count them or should I not count them? It seems like if we're counting them, then we're over-normalizing that one, and we're going to make its value much lower than it should be relative to its neighbors. Maybe you're losing valuable information by doing that. So, again, this is very dependent on the thing we're trying to accomplish with the convolution, but you're absolutely right. Probably what we would do is not count those because they're not real elements. Okay. Okay, so now that said, we already talked about this. Let's take a few questions. Yes? Yeah, you could divide it by the sum of its mass coefficients. Okay, hang on, hang on. Let's, let's look at an example. Question. How, um, is there a way of executing this code uh, so that there's not, like, it looks like this code lends itself to a lot of branch divergence because we'll have, like, 
a bunch of different cases. Some kernels will only be doing like five multiplications, some will be doing 10, some will be doing 13, both vertically and horizontally. So is there a way of like grouping these warps so that similar numbers of uh, each threads grouped into a single warp are doing similar amounts of computation? So he, he brings up the very good point that this code seems like it's gonna have a lot of divergence, right? Because if we look at all the corners or the boundaries, there seems to be a lot of them, right? Because it's kind of related to the perimeter of the input and the size of the mask. The bigger the mask, the more perimeter, yeah, we're gonna have a lot of warps with divergence. Um, so we, we may need to worry about that. Now, typically these images have lots of pixels, 10 million pixels, right? So, yeah, relatively speaking, the boundaries don't account for a lot of that. And typically, for most image processing kernels, we're talking about masks of 7, 9, 11. So, yes, we do have to worry about them, but they may not be as significant as the little tiny example that we have here. But it's a good point. Any other questions? Okay, now I, I think it's time we try to develop an intuitive understanding of what all this convolution business is all about. Okay, so here's a normalization term. Divide by 273. But there's the mask. And this mask has an interesting pattern to it. So if we assume the input N is a grayscale image, two-dimensional image, what do you think this mask will accomplish? Some of you know, maybe you've seen it before, but I want everyone to spend a few minutes just trying to mentally get an understanding. By the way, 273, I think, is the sum of all the coefficients. So I see a few hands, and I, I would hope that probably you're just, you just haven't seen it before, but you're kind of intuitively drawing upon it. Yeah, what do you think this accomplishes? It'll blur the image. Why will it blur the image? It's a Gaussian filter, it will act as a low pass. So let's try to use words that maybe we don't, you know, need to have a, a ECE 210 background to understand. You said all the right things. So you're totally right. Like a weighted average of all the pixels in the neighborhood. Yes. It's going to take a weighted average corresponding to distance away from the center of pixel of all the pixels in the mask. Okay. So the further away the pixel is from the center, the less it will count. And he used the word low pass, meaning any sharp contours, high frequency signals are going to get smoothed away. Okay, and this is, this is right. So if you ever blurred the background of an image that you've taken, something like that, probably a little bigger, probably a 9 by 9 or 11 by 11, Gaussian filter is what will be applied to blur the pixels. Okay, it would be really great if you could kind of convince yourself, yeah, that's what's happening here. Any questions about this? If we didn't divide by 273 here, we didn't normalize, what would happen? Yep. Or white. Yeah. We would go and shift everything towards the extreme, the saturation point. Right? If 255 were the highest you know, magnitude, it could represent white or black. Everything shifts that direction. Right? Okay. So, simple mathematical concept. We apply it to an image, it has a 
visual effect on that image, right? What do you think this mask will do? And maybe some of you have seen it before, but just work it through in your mind. And really what I'm asking is, <clears throat> what does the output P represent? So I give it a big image and I do this across the image. And if you can't read it, it's just a column of ones with a bunch of columns of negative one. If you don't get it right away, don't feel bad. This, you know, if you're seeing convolution for the very first time, we're only about 40 minutes into it, and I'm asking you to have an intuition about it. So don't feel bad if you don't see it right away. But if you do see it and you have a, something you want to share, raise your hand. Uh, someone, I have a call that more frequently. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's trying to find a, a vertical line in the data. I mean, a sharp vertical line. He called it quite crude, and I'll say, yeah, absolutely. We can do better than that, but let's just, for the sake of example, that's what it's doing. So, now let's pause. Simple mathematical operator. Now, trying to get a pattern match in an image, right? So we can find a, row, a column of pixels that are of high intensity. Actually, now we're assuming that, let's say, 255 is black, pure black, right? Because that's what this will do, right? Make sense? What are the negative ones accomplishing? Yeah. So what it does is that it favors a high bit in pixel values, which uh, means that when the mask like sweeps through the image, if there's um, a sharp change in the pixel value of like two uh, of like one section of the image, it will uh, it will favor the uh, high pixel. Let's say that there's a black line, it will favor the black line being next right next to white pixels. In fact, we're looking for something where there's a black line that's at least two pixels away from the neighboring black line. So we're now looking for a pattern here, not just a singular black line, but it's got to be far enough away from the other black lines. Okay? And more towards the vertical as opposed to anything at any other angle. Let's pause, right? That's a very powerful thing. We're looking for a pattern, and we can use this convolutional, convolutional operator to find that pattern. So let's jump ahead. So I think almost everybody has heard of a neural network, and probably most of you have heard of a convolutional neural network, right? Well, that's what the convolutional neural network is doing. It's not taking explicit patterns or masks that I'm providing but it's learning what those mask patterns should be given what output I'm looking to maximize. Like, if I'm trying to build a cat detector, well, clearly maybe this is not the mask that would matter, but there is probably some mask that matters. In fact, it's not a single mask that matters, probably hundreds of masks that matter to find cat images on the internet. I don't know what they are, Probably no human knows what they are, but we can learn them. And that's essentially what those masks are. Okay, does that make sense? Very powerful notion that we can use a convolution to essentially get a signal of a match. 
within the image. Question. This is more of a theoretical question, but do we always assume that the mask is small relative to the size of our image? Do we always assume the mask is small relative to the size of the image? Um, you know, in practice, almost always, always. The images are large, and uh, while in theory you can have a mask as large as your image, in practice, I think they're not useful. An idea, the idea here, especially when we talk about uh, neural networks, is that these small masks, when operated in a hierarchy, are way more effective than big masks because we can look for something called local features. I'll give you an example. If I've got a, uh, an image with some people in it, or just an image, and I'm trying to count how many people are in this image, what a deep learning model will ultimately gravitate towards are things called local features, like eyes. Do I count eyes? Uh, or fingers, right? local features. In the masks, the, in the image, these eyes typically are small. Fingers are small. Masks, therefore, want to be local. Okay. So, in practice, masks tend to be, like I said, 9, 5, 11. Occasionally, you'll get large masks that are let's say 21 in size. Any other questions about this? Okay, cool. We're gonna see much more of this later. So if it doesn't quite still not make sense to you, we'll, we'll come back to it. So now with all this in mind, we haven't written the code for the 2D convolution yet. We'll do that next time. But what I want to start to think about is memory. And I'm going to introduce a new type of CUDA memory to you that's well-tuned for this thing. Okay, so let's talk about the access pattern for M. So the, M, the elements of M are fixed. Like whenever I have a convolution that I'm applying, the mask doesn't change, it's fixed. If I'm applying the Gaussian blur, that was the, the first mask I showed you, I apply the same mask across the entire image. If my image is 10 million pixels, I'm applying that mask 10 million times. Okay, so it's not changing. And it's also the fact that I don't really change the order in which I access M. So I can also maybe optimize the way I store M. So what we are going to say is this M, because it doesn't change, is a good candidate for an optimized memory on the GPU called the constant memory. Okay. Now, some people ask, well, why does the GPU even have a constant memory? And if you're a 3D graphics expert, you probably know something called a texture, texture map. Uh, if you don't, that's okay. It's, it's not that important, but it's a pretty important concept for uh, 3D graphics. And GPUs, after all, are 3D graphics accelerators. That's what they do most of the time. Occasionally, we use them for deep learning and CUDA and all that other stuff. So they've got lots of texture memory on the chip to handle 3D graphics needs. And we're kind of repurposing this texture memory for this thing here, constants. Okay, so let's see how they work. Let's see how these memories work. Um, it turns out that Alongside global memory, which is off the chip. By the way, I, there were a few people that came up to me last time. Sorry, this is a bit of a digression. And people were very confused about 
global memory and DRAM and CPU memory? How does all that stuff fit together? And I made a mental note to myself that I should come in today and have a diagram prepared for you just to show you physically what all this stuff is. But I didn't remember it until just now. <laughs> so I will come prepared for Thursday and just have a diagram that shows you what all these memories are and physically where they sit. Okay, because I can understand and appreciate how confusing it is. So to add to the confusion, I'm gonna introduce another memory today. But I'll clear it up next time. Constant memory. All right, this constant memory is on chip. It's not on the board. It's not with the CPU. It's on the chip. And the constant memory is something that we can access fairly quickly. It's about on the order of five cycles, which looks a lot like shared memory. Okay. And this constant memory, because it's constant, gets cached as opposed to, like shared memory, managed by us. Okay. So as long as I put the data in constant memory, if I use it, it gets pulled close to where all the computing is happening within the SM automatically. Okay, so let's, let's take a look. So as a, as a, just as a kind of taking a, a step back and getting everybody on the same page, I want to say two things. First is, remember we talked about memory last time. And when we talked about memory, we said that memory is optimized for bursts. I access X, location X. I'm going to get a X plus 1, X plus 2, X plus 3. I'm going to get a burst of data around X because it's just the way these memories are designed. So just to make it concrete, let's say it's 128 bits, meaning if I access X, I get 128-bit aligned burst around X. That's a line. We're going to call that a linear set of addresses called a line. Creative name, I know, a line. Okay, so we've got that line of data. And typically what we will do when we have a cache involved is that Cache will store, a, 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 it's essentially an array of these lines that we recently accessed that are stored on chip. So if I access X, we get 128 bits, sorry, 1,024 bits that surround X. And we're going to put those in the cache on the chip. Then if I access another one, I get all 1,028 bits 1,024 bits, and I put those also in the cache, and so on and so forth. Eventually, my cache is full, and I have to throw one out, but it's arbitrary. I'll pick anything, throw it out, put in the new thing. Okay, so that's essentially a cache. It stores a copy of that thing from memory nearby. That's all a cache is. As a programmer, I don't need to worry about it because it's automatically managed. And if I just happen to access things that fall in the cache, then I don't need to go to memory in order to access them. Okay, so why I'm saying all this is because anything that's in constant memory is going to be managed automatically by the hardware this way. So let me say it another way. If I access M, the mask, M ends up in constant memory. I put M in constant memory, and then as I use M, M gets cached within the, within the GPU hardware itself, and I have fast access to it. Okay. Um, let me just move on here. 
Now, just to be very clear, right, uh, and, I, and I said this before, shared memory and a cache function the same way, meaning they're both storing data within the SM so that all the threads that are on that block in that SM can get rapid access to it. Now, the difference is the programmer controls the shared memory, which we do by declaring shared memory variables and copying the data into them explicitly. Whereas with the cache, the contents are implicit. If I access a variable, the thing ends up in the cache. And it might be there next time I access, it might not be, I don't know. All right? So, um, what I'm going to say is the, the GPU has, uh, there's a lot on here. Um, what I want to focus on is this. Okay, we've got these caches. By the way, okay, so if I, one of the complications with a cache, especially on a very parallel device, like a GPU, is the following. So let's say one SM accesses um, memory location X, another SM accesses memory location X. And if this SM writes to X, what do we need to do let me back up. Okay, so we've got two threads on two different SMs. So they're part of different blocks. Okay, so this thread accesses global memory location X, and so does this one. If we were caching X on the two SMs, what we have to do is we have to ensure that if one SM updates X, that the other SM sees that update. And if we're caching, we run into lots of problems because now we have to keep all the caches consistent with those updates. So, and that's expensive. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, in the case of the GPU caches, we're only caching constants because those values don't change. Okay, by design, they don't change, so we don't have to keep them consistent because no thread will write to them. They cannot be updated. Okay, so because if we update them, then we run into problems with consistency. Now, here's the point. So what we're going to say is we're going to take the, the masks in our convolution and we're going to put them into this constant memory because they don't change. They stay fixed through the duration of the computation. Okay, so how do we use constant memory? What we're going to do is we're going to declare a constant memory object by using the underscore underscore constant descriptor. So M, the mask, is underscore underscore constant float mask. Okay, so we've declared in constant memory this thing called mask. So that's simple. Let's fill in all the gaps. But there's a question here. Okay, good. He, he, he brings up a good question. Okay, so let's say we put the masks in constant memory. Okay, so they're there in constant memory. Now we've got all these warps and all these SMs trying to access 
that constant memory. Isn't the same thing as global memory then? We just run into a bottleneck. How is this different? Very good question. So let's walk through this. So we have a mask. We have a two by two, we have a two dimensional convolution we're gonna do on a big image, 10 megapixel. Create a bunch of blocks, blocks get spread across a bunch of SMs. They all start to load mask. So at first, they're all going to global memory or the constant memory. And they're pulling in the mask. So it seems like that should be a big bottleneck. And indeed it is. Okay. So that first, let's say they're all synchronized just to make things easy. So they're all trying to access the mask in order to calculate the first output pixel for each block. Now, Here's the magic. What happens the second time through? The second time through, that masks, those mask values have been cached within the SM. Just like it was as, as if they were put into shared memory, except I didn't have to put them into shared memory because it's a cache. So now to calculate the second output pixel, hits in the cache, hits in the cache, hits in the cache, it's in the cache all the way through. And therefore, the problem goes away. Make sense? Right? So the power of the cache for this constant, pretty significant in that sense. Question. Well, you bring up a good point. Let me, let me just pause and answer your question. So he asked the question, well, couldn't we have used the, the constant memory and the cache, therefore, for a matrix multiply? Um, we could have. You can try it. Actually, it may work because for the little examples that we did, the... Um, the inputs are a constant, okay? Uh, the issue I think you pointed out is that they aren't fixed per tile, right? Because a block might come in and we might use a, a different part of the matrix, the input matrices. Another block will use a different part of the input matrices and so on and so forth. So we might not be able to fit all that data in the cache. So what happens in that case is for tiled matrix multiply, because we know a priori the pattern, tiling is super efficient because we're in charge of how everything goes. Okay. Whereas with a cache, best effort. We don't know. And it might work, it might not, depending on how all the blocks interact with each other. Question. Well, if it's not there, what happens? Let's say for whatever reason, I, I'm trying to access M sub five. It's not in the cache. What happens then? What do you think the GPU does? It doesn't throw an error. Yeah? It goes to constant memory, right? There's always a copy in off-chip memory someplace. So I can always find it if I don't find it in the cache. And it's because, and if it's constant, it's always a good copy. Okay, so let's move on. So I can declare the variable as a constant memory variable or object by using the constant descriptor. Okay, so I've got this thing in constant memory and what I need to do is I need to fill it with data. Right? If there's a mask on the CPU, I need to copy it over. And we have to use 
could a mem copy to symbol um, uh, in order to copy it instead of just a standard mem copy? Okay, so let's see how all of it comes together. So we declare the thing uh, constant. Okay, so we've created MC, and it's just mask with by mask with. Um, and uh, what I do is I initialize my CPU version of the mask. So just to be clear, this is CPU code. So I take the, the mask, I'm just gonna put random values in that mask. So here's my mask on the CPU, and I'm gonna copy it to MC. So from here to there, by using the CUDA mem copy to symbol. Um, and we're using CUDA mem copy to symbol because MC is a named variable, statically allocated, named variable. Uh, so we're gonna copy to the symbol's address. Okay, so there we go. And then the kernel, which we will talk about next time. All right, so, um, it's kind of a weird lecture. In fact, I think this is it, yeah. Um, in the sense that we didn't really talk about the kernel yet. We talked about the pattern. We talked about the 1D version. Next time, we're gonna talk about the kernel and tiling that kernel because we're not done just dealing with memory bandwidth. We've gotta tile it and tiling the convolution turns out to be a little tricky. Okay, so before we go, let's talk about the pattern itself. Any questions about convolution? Yeah, question back there. It implies that it's in global, it's actually stored in global memory, okay? But when we load it, it gets stored in the constant cache, okay? So it's just a way for the hardware to know what to do with it. Okay, there's a few questions here, yep. Uh, just for clarification, uh, uh, when we solve the congestion problem, uh, is it true that each time a program accesses the constant memory, it creates a replica? Yes, exactly. So his point is, okay, the idea with this constant memory uh, is that we're creating copies of the data. Okay, in fact, that's exactly what we're doing. We're creating a copy of the mask and we're creating copies within each SM that accesses mask, right? And by creating copies, we run into the problem of what happens if somebody updates the copy? How do the other others get a good version of that copy, that's difficult. We, we circumvent that problem by saying, ah, they're all constant, they don't change. Right, that's the way this works. Yes, question. Um, so just regarding, um, so you said that the constant memory will attempt to cache into the SM and the, it said in like both and above architecture, so it just caches into what each SM clarifies as like, the shared memory as well, like that, you know, local memory bank. So since the cache is a, you know, best effort, you know, system, it's not going to guarantee that you're going to get a cache hit every time. Because at that point, it wouldn't, you know, really. It's just not the case. So one question is, um, is there, are is there any reason to, not any reason, but is there a way to check beforehand um, whether or not, depending on how much shared memory you're using, um, you know, in your kernel, whether or not you're going to whether it's even possible, whether it's even, wait, never mind, I just answered my phone. Okay, cool, because I lost you there. Yeah. Okay, hey, um, 
Um, I, I got a question for you all. Okay, so we got a few extra minutes. I want to come back to this thing. Okay, and I'm going to ask you the question. We, we, all, we all understand how this thing works, or what it's doing. And we said, well, what it's doing is it's finding a horizontal line, a vertical line, that's five pixels tall. That's not surrounded by any other vertical line, at least um, two pixels away from it. What if I wanted to find a vertical line that extended from the top of the image to the bottom of the image? And all I gave you was this. Yeah. And what would those masks be? I'm only giving you this mask. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Exactly. So what he said is, I have the original input image N. I run the mask through it. I get image P. What does image P represent? If there is a high intensity pixel in image P, what does that mean? So there's like a line there in the original image. There is a line in that neighborhood on the mask in that original image. What if the line right underneath, the pixel right underneath that pixel was also high? High intensity. And so on and so on and so on and so on. I'll get another vertical line. Now, if I take that and I keep doing that over and over again, what happens? You see what's going on here, right? The, and by the way, the, the, the image M to P shrinks a little bit. Why does it shrink a little bit? Or it can shrink a little bit. Because, well, the images, the pixels on the boundaries, I might want to throw them away because I just had to ghost them out anyways. So I can always shrink P a little bit. So as I shrink P, I can shrink it until I have got one pixel left. That one pixel at the end of that whole iterative process tells me, essentially, it gives me some indication of how much of a vertical line there existed in that original image. Do you see the power of that? By the way, that's a convolutional neural network of the simplest variety. Purely linear convolutional network. But that's what a convolutional network is. Okay. Make sense? Any questions? Okay, well, in that case, why don't we break a little early? And when we meet on Thursday, I will provide a memory diagram. I promise.